Yeah, welcome to my fourth lecture in quantitative finance. Less and less people here, I recognize. Why is that? <laughs> Maybe it's too early in the morning, right? <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, so what did we do so far? So we learned that we, from the OLS framework that we used actually here in this course all the time, uh, we have seen that we start with the ordinary, the simple linear regression model, yeah, and where our y vector, in this case, in, in this context, our y vector are the excess returns <coughs> of the stocks, x is our regressor matrix, our asset pricing model. In our simple case, it's the cap M. Then we have the beta vector, which gives us the sensitivities against the intercept term or the market vector in excess form. And then we have the firm specific part of the model or the idiosyncratic part, uh, and this is in this case given by the intercept term. Yeah, maybe I close the door here. So then we also have seen that uh, we can, that we, we have derived the, the, the point estimator for our sensitivities here for the intercept term and for the market factor. We use the simple equation here that we know from Ecometrics 1, yeah, we transpose the regressor matrix of our factor, our, our risk factors, take it times itself, we, we invert this matrix times itself transposed times the excess returns of the stock. Yeah. In this case, I disregard from the index i because, of course, we have to do it for each single stock, so this would be the beta i for the corresponding stock i. Yeah. So that's the simple, very simple framework, and we can do many things with that. Yeah. We also have discussed that our point estimates are a linear function of the excess returns itself. So the excess returns are random variable. They are, in our simple framework, assumed to be normally distributed. They are a linear function of the error terms. The error terms are random, therefore, the excess returns are random, and since our point estimates are a linear function of the excess returns, they are random itself. Any linear function of a normally distributed random variable is normally distributed as well, so our point estimates, our point estimator is normally distributed as well. Yeah? Then we have seen, once we have estimated uh, our point or beta hat, given the, just by the data, we can also estimate the uh, residuals here, which are given by the index returns minus the re <coughs> regressor matrix times the estimated parameters. Yeah. Then we get the re estimated re residual vector here. Because we need, we need this uh, residual vector here in order to estimate, in order to get an estimate for the residual variance that we, in turn, need for our estimated covariance matrix of the point estimator here. Why do we want to know that? Well, if we want to test the cap M, or if we want to see if any of the parameters are significant, we need to have the covariance matrix of the point estimators, which we have uh, derived yesterday and it is given by this expression here that we now make use of. Yeah? So everything is given by the data. Once we have the data, we can come up with all these uh, simple expressions here, plug it into MATLAB, form a loop, and do it for any number of assets that we have in our asset portfolio. Yeah? We also have discussed, OK, this is just a number here. Our, residual, our estimated residual, uh, uh, our estimated residual variance is just a number. It's just the estimated residual vector transposed. It's one by t times itself. It's t by one. So what, what we have here is the scalar product. It's a number, one by one. It's a number times one over t minus n, which is basically the number of observations, yeah, minus the uh, numbers of regressors that we have in our X matrix. It's basically standardized. It takes somehow the, the sample average, it takes the sample average of the squared residuals. Yeah? But that's just a number here. 
And what, and, and what is this guy here? If we, if, we, if we transpose our regressor matrix, it's 2 by t times itself. So what we have is a 2 by 2 matrix. And we invert that guy. We, we, we built the matrix product and we invert it. So it's 2 by 2. Yeah. This is a, the whole expression here is a 2 by 2 matrix, which I have written here like that. Yeah. X11, X12. So, and if we multiply this, this matrix here out, given the data, on the main diagonal, we have the interesting things for us. Yeah. We have discussed yesterday, well, the first element on the main diagonal is the variance of the intercept term, because it's in the first column vector here of our regressor matrix. So the, so the corresponding element is the first element on the main diagonal of our covariance matrix. That's the variance of the intercept term. The second element on the main diagonal is corresponding to the second column vector of our regressor matrix. And the second uh, column vector here is our, our market access returns. Therefore, the second element on the main diagonal is the corresponding variance of the market factor. Above and below the main diagonal, it's the same element. We, we, we also said yesterday that the covariance matrix is symmetric, which means that all elements on the, that are above the main diagonal are the same below the main diagonal. Yeah? So the covariance between alpha and beta is the same like the covariance between beta and alpha. Yeah? It doesn't matter. The order doesn't matter. So what we have here above and, and below the main diagonal in our simple framework is the covariance between the intercept term point estimate and the point estimate for the market factor. So what we have here is it's the covariance between the intercept term alpha and the point estimate beta. Yeah. And it's the same what we have here. It's a covariance between beta and alpha then. Yeah. So in order to get the t-statistic, for instance, for our intercept term, the alpha, or in this notation, I think it's beta zero. Yeah. So what we have to do is we have to grab here from this vector here. This is a vector that has the alpha as first element, and the estimated beta is the second element. Yes, very market sensitivity. What, so what we have to do is we have to grab this, the first element here out of this vector, and divide it by the square root of the first element here on the main diagonal. If we take the square root out of, out of this guy, what we get is the standard deviation of the intercept term. Yeah? So we have to divide the alpha by the square root of this x11, what is here on the main diagonal. And then we get the t-statistic, the corresponding t-statistic of the point estimate here that corresponds to the intercept term. Yeah? If we want to get the same, uh, for the second element, which is the sensitivity against market factor here, what we have to do is, okay, then we have to get, grab the second guy here, the beta hat, the estimated beta hat, from our beta vector and divide it by the square root of the second element here on the main diagonal, which is our x22. Yeah. I guess it's clear. Now imagine if you would use, if you would write the master thesis or whatever, or your RFM, term paper, and uh, you would use the Farmer and Friends five-factor model, yeah, and the intercept term, then this becomes a t by six matrix. Uh, five regressors plus the intercept is six. This is a t by six. And what we would get here is then a six by six matrix, of course. And if you would like to have the t statistic for the profitability factor, which is the last which, which would be the last vector in our regressor matrix. Uh, the last guy, if we remember from the RFM course, is the profitability factor. Yeah? It's the sixth element here. So we would divide then, we would grab the sixth element out of this six by one vector and divide it by the sixth element on this main diagonal here. Very simple. Yeah. So you can extend this, of course, to any, to any size of your data set. Yeah, same thing, same procedure. Yeah. 
So is this clear to everybody? This is now what we will just employ. You know, now we know what's going on here. Now we employ all this stuff in a for loop. Yeah? Because now we want to test um, the cap M. So we are interested in these intercept terms in the alphas here of our test assets. And we have in our universe 14 stocks. And now we want to say, OK, how many of these 14 stocks have a T statistic that indicates that the systematic mispricing, yeah, the, which is given by the intercept term, is uh, significant. Yeah. If, there, if there are many, many stocks that have a significant alpha, obviously then our capital, capital asset pricing model does not price our test assets correctly. So if all of them would have an alpha that is not significant from not significantly different from zero, we would assume, yeah, the cap M is able to price these test assets quite well. Because there's no, in, in this case, there would be no systematic mispricing going on. Yeah. But I assume you have seen this already in Equatrix 1, right? So this is not really something new, is it? Is it? Is it new? At least it's not covered in the case. It's sorry. It's not covered in the case. It's it's not covered. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Who knows what you learned there? I don't. Who knows? I don't know. So, but yeah, this is at least uh, what I. I mean, this is like what actually I learned in. When, when I studied uh, at university, and uh, this was basically in the first of four econometrics courses. So I had four courses in econometrics, and this was basically in the first course they covered the um, linear regression model and uh, the corresponding characteristics. Well then, so we yesterday we were let me just go back here. So yesterday we saw that we have to store, we, we created a vector a matrix of zeros, yeah, which we denoted as beta, like in the earlier example. Yeah, it's a, we have 14 stocks, so it's 14 by 2. Yeah. In the first column, we wanted to store the, the point estimates of the alpha of the intercept term, and in the second column, we wanted to store the point estimates of the market sensitivities for each of our 14 stocks. Yeah. So here's the alpha hat, and here is the beta hat of stock i. Yeah. And i is from 1 to 14. Yeah. So this is what we have done yesterday. So what we wanted to do today is, okay, we want to, we want to, add, we want to store the corresponding t statistics of these guys here as well. So again, what we do is we create, again, a, a matrix that has, of course, it must have the same dimension as our point estimate because what we will do is we will now access each element here because we have seen, okay, it's the point estimate alpha i hat divided by the square root of the standard devi of the corresponding standard deviation. Yeah. So this, this, is, this is now what, what we want to do. We grab this guy that we have already estimated in the previous loop yeah, and divide it by the, standard, by, the, by the corresponding standard deviation using the covariance matrix. And we have to do it only, we have to write it actually only once and MATLAB does it like many times in this loop. Uh, this is also what we, what we will see. So we, again, we create a matrix of zeros in order to store our results. And this matrix is then denoted as, in our script, as, let me see, t underscore statistics underscore beta. Yeah? This is equal to 0, 40 by 1. So it has the same dimension as our beta matrix where we stored our point estimate. So, but now we want to store the corresponding T statistics. So what's going on here? We have now two for loops. Yeah. In the previous example, when we stored the parameter estimates, we, had just, we employed just one for loop because what we did was in, in each 
iteration, we estimated the corresponding point estimate for each single asset. Yeah? Then we, we, we transpose this guy, this two by one vector became then a one by two vector, a row vector, and we are storing this row vector in each of these rows here of our beta hat matrix. So in the first row, we had the corresponding alpha and beta from stock one. Yeah? Then we took the second, in the second iteration, it took the second point estimate, the, the alpha and the beta for stock two, and stored in the second row, yeah? and so on, and until we have completed all of our 14 rows. Yeah? But what we do now is we start with the intercept terms. Yeah? So first, j is 1 to 2. So we, we start with, with, with j is 1. This is now j in our notation. Here's j1. And the second column is j2. So what's going on then? So first we want to store an element here. So j is 1 and i is 1 in our first iteration. Yeah? In the second iteration, j is 1 and i is 2. So the second loop, after the second loop is completed, yeah? after we have gone through all i's from, from i1 until i14 or ik, only then we take the next column vector and j is then 2 and i is 1 again. Yeah? But first we complete the first column here and store the t statistics of the intercept terms for all of the stocks. Once this is completed, we store the corresponding point estimates for the market sensitivities for all stocks. Yeah? But first we go through the intercept terms. So what's happening here? So beta underscore 1. And we have seen this yesterday. Yeah? What, is, what is happening here is the same like yesterday. We estimate now once, once again this equation here. Yeah? It's our OLS framework, yeah? like yesterday. Same thing. So what we get is we get the, if i is 1, we get the point estimates for our first stock. Yeah? And we get this vector here. And, we, and now we don't store it. Yeah? It's, in every iteration, it's overwritten. You see, there's, we, we, we do not store it here somewhere. It's overwritten because we don't need it. We, we just need it in order to estimate the covariance matrix in this case. Yeah? Because we, and moreover, we have already stored it here. Yeah? And as I told you always, you know, there are always different ways to come, to come up with uh, this result. There are different ways to come up with, uh, to, to estimate the covariance matrix or to estimate the corresponding statistics. You know, this is just one way. And more advanced guys, they would probably do everything uh, at once. You know, they, were, they would store both the point estimates for the parameters and the t-statistics uh, using the same loop. You know. But we, are, we take it slowly, you know, and we do it step by step here in order to get an understanding of what's going on. So j is 1, i is 1, what we get here in the first um, part after the second for loop here. So we, once again, we estimate the point estimate for the, for the excess returns for the first stock here. So we get the betas, the, the alpha 1, uh, and the beta 1 for the first stock. So what happens then? It says, uh, let me just take it away here. It says u is equal with y1 <coughs> i minus, and then we have this expression in brackets again, yeah, where, where it says constant and x, x1 times beta underscore 1. What happens here? So it's nothing else 
but this line here. Yeah, we want to estimate the residuals given our excess returns of the first stock, yeah, because this is what we do there. Yeah, when it says y1, and then this double point tells you take, take the whole column and which one. Now, in our first iteration, i is 1, so it takes the, the first whole column, which are the excess returns of the first stock, yeah, minus, then in our parent thesis, I told you yesterday, there's, it, it's nothing else but the regressor matrix here that we defined. It's the vector of constants and the vector of excess returns because our x1 are the ex excess returns of the market factor, yeah, times beta underscore 1. And this is exactly what we iterated earlier. This is our point estimate for the, for the first stock. Yeah? So it's, it's nothing else but, but this equation here. So we, we, we estimate the residuals, the corresponding residuals for the first stock using the cap M. So it's, it's this equation here. This is clear to everybody. Yeah. This is what's going on here. And actually, I also I, I wrote here as, ex, as an explanation, estimating the OLS residuals for each stock. So then, what, what, what are we doing then? We estimate the variance of residuals for each stock. So this is our estimated sigma squared. It's the residual variance. And I use now this formula here. I basically, what's going on here, we neglect from the n here. I mean, if your sample is large enough, it doesn't matter, obviously. If you, if you divide by, by t or by t minus n. If, if, if t goes to infinity, it doesn't matter. If, you, if, if, if a sample is large enough, then it doesn't matter if you divide the scalar product of the residual vector by t or by t minus n. Yeah, but this is what was going on here. The variance is equal to 1 over t times u transposed times u. Uh, that's, ex that's exactly what's going on here. So we want to estimate the residual variance. Uh, because we need it for the covariance matrix of our point estimates here. So then, now it becomes interesting. Next, beta underscore variance should be equal with variance. So of course MATLAB has it in the memory. So everything that we have done here in the, in the, in the loop before, until it's overwritten, it's in the memory. So MATLAB knows all that stuff here. So it now multiplies our estimated variance that we had here from the earlier step, the receivable variance, times, then we have again in the, in the parentheses here, this expression is our regressor matrix, transpose times itself, inverted. So this, this is exactly what we have done here, what we have derived here in, in matrix algebra, is exactly this expression here. It takes the regressor matrix times itself, takes it to, to the power of minus one, which is simply the inverse, and multiplies it with the residual variance that we estimated in the previous step. That's exactly what's going on in this line of the code. So then next, now we finally store something. Now you see here, we, we access again our t underscore st statistics underscore beta i1 and j is 1. So now we are here uh, in our zero matrix and now we put in something here. So, and what do we put in here? So, it's the beta i j, so i is 1 and j is 1, so we grab now, and we know we are still in the same loop, so, so everything, MATLAB has everything in the memory, now it, it gets us, um, it, it goes now back, so beta is, is still stored. Yeah, we, we have stored it, we have done it actually yesterday, here. 
we have, cre we have constructed our, our matrix of uh, point estimates. So, and it has the same dimension as our T statistics, right? So what it, what, what it does now is, okay, it says, give me element i, j, i is one, j is one of our beta matrix. And of course, the first element in our beta matrix is the intercept estimate or the alpha for our first stock. So give me this guy here. <coughs> and divide it by the square root of what is here. It's the beta variance jj. So i is 1 and j is 1. 1, 1. So element 1, 1 from our, beta var from our, from our matrix beta underscore variance. So what is the element 1, 1? in our matrix beta underscore variance, the element 1, 1 is the variance of the intercept term here. So now we take the square root out of this guy. And this, and this is in the denominator. So to take the square root of this guy, this is our calculation, and put it in here store it here. This is what happens here in, in this code. Hmm? So then J remains one. But in this in the next iteration I is two. Everything else is the same, but i is 2. So we are still here. So what we, the, the only thing that that's, that's changes here is, so we, we do the same thing once again. Yeah? We, we get the, the corresponding point estimates, our alpha and our beta for the second stock. Yeah? We again, you know, then, then i is 2. So. The only thing that changes is our i index here. So i is then 2. We use the same regressor matrix, yeah, obviously. But here we use the exact returns of the second stock. You know, for our OLS formula, we use the exact returns of the second stock for compounding the residual variance, yeah, because i is then 2. Again, we get a different estimate for the residual variance here. Everything is now overwritten here, what, what is in the second for loop. Yeah, so again, we get a new, we get the corresponding covariance matrix, beta underscore variance of our second stock. Yeah, so this guy is the new, obviously, after when we uh, are on the second iteration. So this guy changes here. So again, we, then we access from our estimated beta matrix where we store the point estimates. J is still one, but I is two. So on the second position of our beta matrix, we find the corresponding point estimate for the second stock here, the corresponding alpha of the second stock. And then we divide it by the square root of beta underscore variance, JJ. So J is still 1, so it's element 1, 1 from beta underscore variance, and this is now the estimated covariance matrix of the second stock. So, and, and again, we take the square root from element J, J, and J is 1, so it's element 1, 1. And what we get is the T statistic for the second stock's intercept term. Yeah. And again, we store it then here as second element as t underscore statistics underscore beta 2, 1. Yeah. Still first column, but second row. And then we get a figure here, the corresponding t statistic of the second stock. Yeah. First stock is maybe 1 point, I don't know, 1.5. Second stock has maybe 0 0.8 or something. Who knows? Yeah. So, and it does so until we have completed 
to estimate the T statistics for the intercept terms for all stocks until 14. Okay, because we have K equal to 14 stocks. So once this is completed, we go to the next column, then J is 2, and we start again with I is 1. J is 2, now I is 1. Now we are here. We want to put in something here. And, and what we want to put in here is the T statistic for the beta, or the market sensitivity, of the first stock. So everything is now again overwritten here, and again it starts to estimate, we, we start to estimate um, the corresponding point estimates here for the first stock. So it's the same what we have done already in the previous iteration when J was 1. So this is the same thing actually what happens here. Everything is the same thing until the last line here. Yeah? So first we estimate the, the sensitivities, like the, the intercept point estimate and the point estimate for the market sensitivity, yeah? then, because then I, uh, Y1 is uh, here, it indicates that we take the excess returns of the first stock, because I is then 1 in the first iteration, <coughs> Then again, we compound the corresponding uh, residual vector. We estimate the corresponding residual variance of the first stock. So everything is the same like, like it was when J was 1. Yeah? So then B under, underscore variance is also the same. We estimate again the same covariance matrix here, like, like in the first iteration or in the first outer loop when J was 1. It's the same thing. Uh, we estimate again the whole guy here. But then something different happens. Yeah? So we want to store in T, st T underscore statistics underscore beta I1, J2. Now we are here. So put in there. So well, what we have here? Beta I1, J2. Uh, in our beta matrix, where we have estimated the point estimates, in the second column, and in the, and, and the first element, is the market sensitivity, like the beta, of the first stock. Take, take this guy and divide it by the square root of beta underscore variance jj. J is now 2. So now it takes the second element here on the main diagonal. 2, 2. Take the square root out of this guy here. Divide it by the point estimate against the market factor. That's what we do. And that's the t-statistic. And then put it in here. So here we store it. Then it goes to the next stock and does the same thing. Yeah? J is 2, and then I is 2. So it does everything all over again using the excess returns of the second stock. The same formula. Then again, it takes the corresponding second element on the main diagonal of the covariance matrix of the second stock, divides it by the point estimate for the beta of the second stock, yeah, takes the square root out of this uh, variance here, it gives, gives us the t statistic, and stores it as the second element in the second column of our, in our matrix T underscore statistics underscore beta. Until we have completed this for all 14 stocks, yeah? Until I is 14 or K. And then we have completed both loops, like the inner loops and the two outer loops. And then we have radically stored in our matrix here the corresponding T statistics. So if we have the Farmer and French five factor model, yeah, and our regressor matrix would be T by six in this case, and we have still our 14 K equal to 14 stocks, then, of course, this guy here would be 14 by 6, yeah? because we have also the intercept term, 
to account for. And the first loop would run from j is 1 to 6. Everything else remains the same. So that's all what we would have to change. And you get the corresponding estimates uh, for the Farman French six factor model. So you just have to upload then the data matrix, push the enter button, and MATLAB would do the whole procedure. So, you know, you see, once you have written this code once, or once you know what's going on, it's, it's very easy to make some small changes and to use it for a different research question or for a different, like, asset pricing model. Yeah. So any questions? This is clear to everybody what's, what's going on here. So it's basically what we just do is we simply use basic econometrics, and that's still very simple, to be honest, and we plug it into MATLAB, yeah, and let MATLAB do the, the calculations for us. Yeah. That's what we do. So now we want to have a look on, we want to make a decision here. We want to check, okay, does the cat M work given our 14 stocks that, that we have? So, once we have run this code, and what we can do is we can plug in just beta into the command window, push the enter button, and I told you if we do not write this column here, uh, this um, colon here behind the command, then MATLAB would spit us out what it is. So if you just write beta and it, we push the enter button, it, it gives us immediately the corresponding uh, matrix of point estimates for our parameters here. So this is our, what we see here is in the first column, we see the corresponding intercept term. So for the first stock, for instance, in our sample, the alpha, so the intercept term, is 1.46% per month. Yeah. Our returns are given in, in excess form so this, uh, this means the, this, the first stock in our sample generates 1.46% per month excess returns after controlling for the market-specific risk. Uh, so the exposure against our OMX30 index is 0 0.73, so the, which means if the stock index increases by 1%, this stock increases on average by 0.73%. And if the stock index does not move if, if, if the in, in one month, then the average increase of the stock is still 1.46%. Yeah. Because this is the part of, of the excess return that is unexplained or not driven by the exposure against the market factor by, by our X in this case, by our independent rival. Now, if X is zero, then the alpha gives, gives us the, the, the Y, or in, in, which is in, in our case the excess return of the first stock, and this is, oh, is 1.46, which is quite interesting investment, right? Yeah. So the second stock has an alpha of 0.86 and a beta of 0.84, which means, okay, if the stock market increases by 1%, this stock generates 0.84% on average. But if the stock index does not change, yeah, if the I guess return is zero, 
then the stock has an average return, generates an average return of 0.86% per month. So this is, this is the way how we would interpret this uh, table here. Yeah. And now we want to have, uh, we want to see the corresponding t-statistics. How do the t-statistics look like? So this is what we have given here. Again, we, we would plug in in our command window t underscore statistics underscore beta and then just push the enter button and the MATLAB would spit us out what it is. So what we would get are the corresponding point estimates for our t-statistics. Yeah? So what we have what we see here, the first element, so if you have done everything all right, yeah, and you have uploaded the data center in your computer and you have uh, just copied the code into your meta program and then pushed the run button, so what you should get is um, that the first t-statistic for the intercept of the first stock is 2.89 or 2.90 actually because it's rounded 2.90. And the t-statistic for the market sensitivity is 9.17. So what does that mean? I would, this, I would take this away now. Well, hopefully you have copied that. Did you copy that? Come on, be a man. That's good. So, so you remember from the RFM course, hopefully as well. You know, some of you have a, com a competitive advantage here because they took the RFM course already and they know most of the things, right? So. We have our, the distribution for our point estimates. Uh, let's, let's say this is the alpha, alpha 1. And we know the distribution is normal according to our assumptions. So the first t statistic is 2.89. What, what does it tell us? What is the critical value for 2.5% probability mass on the left hand, on the right hand side of the normal distribution, of the standard normal distribution. Isn't it 1.96? Yes, exactly. 1.96 and minus 1.96, right? So here, in this area, we have 2.5% of the probability <coughs> And here as well, 2.5% probability. So if we test a parameter for significance, we usually use the, 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 the values 1.96 and minus 1.96. So whenever the point estimate is above or below this value, yeah, if it's in the critical area, then we would reject the null hypothesis that the point estimate would be zero. So we would say, OK this parameter estimate is statistically significant. So our first alpha, we, we remember, it was 1.47% per month, right? So the t statistic is 2.90. So it's somewhere here. No, I can't do that. I have to put it here. So what, what does that mean? Here's 2.90. In the term paper, there will be the question, does this stock generate excess returns that are significantly different from zero, yes or no? For sure, this is one question in the term paper, for sure. Yeah. So obviously, the t-statistic is much larger than 1.96. So on a 5% level, and this is what we usually do in in finance research or in any kind of research, if you read any research paper, not, not, not only in finance, in anything, <coughs> it's usually 5% level. Yeah? So when, whenever the t-statistic is above 1.96, we would say, okay, on a 5% level, this stock generates abnormal returns. Yeah? After controlling for the market factor. 
on the 5% level. And of course, the exposure against market factor is 9.17, which is not very surprising. Okay, it's, I mean, it, it's, it's, it must be like that because, you know, in the Swedish economy, there are not so many stocks, like in Finland, yeah, there are not so many stocks. Uh, there are 30 stocks that, that spend the, the OMX 30, and in, in Finland, it's, it's, it's 25 stocks that are in the leading market index. So, of course, and I, if you take like a subset of 14 stocks out of this 30 stocks, of course, the, you know, it must be highly significant here, the sensitivity against the market factor. Hmm. So all sensitivities, as you see there in the second column, all sensitivities against market factor are highly significant. Yeah. Point estimates between, what do we have, 7 and 11. Yeah. So what about the t-statistics of the second stock? The alpha, if we, if we again check the, the intercept term, the abnormal return, the, mis, the mispricing. Uh, and, and, and all of these you know, are synonyms. You can say, you can call it the intercept term, it's, it's the abnormal return, it's mispricing, you know, it's, it's, and, and we are talking always about the same thing. You know, it's, it's just the regression intercept. Okay? So for the second term, the t-statistic is 1.82. Yeah, so 1.82 is somewhere here. So if we would just test, and uh, if we would just test for significance, then we, then we would say, okay, on the 5% level, the second stock does not seem to generate any significant abnormal returns. Yeah. But if we would test, now, and now we have to think, if we would do down a one-sided test, If we, if we would say, okay, um, test if the abnormal returns are significantly larger than zero. It's in a one-sided test. This tail doesn't matter. And once, if we test larger than zero, we have different critical values, right? It's then somewhere, I think it's 1.76, I think. I don't, I don't remember 100%. But uh, we want to have 5% probability mass here, only on the, on the right-hand tail. Yeah. And in this case, if we test, if it's larger than zero, if our null, null hypothesis is OK, The alpha, the estimated alpha of stock one is larger than zero. Uh, no, sorry, we have to put it un into the alternative hypothesis, right? It's at our H1. And our H0 or our, uh, null hypothesis is that the estimated alpha one is equal to zero. So equal to zero as a null hypothesis and as the alternative hypothesis that the alpha one is larger than zero. Then we would like to have 5% of the probability mass only on the one tail here, and then the, and then the, the critical value is smaller than 1.96. It's something like 1.76 or so. And then, if, if you would test this hypothesis, then this 1.82 is still uh, above this, this critical value. In, in this case, we would conclude, okay, this stock generates returns, upnormal returns that are larger than zero. So it depends on the hypothesis. Usually we have the hypothesis equal to zero against unequal to zero. And then we have these critical values that we discussed before. Yeah? We have this uh, 1.96 and minus 1.96. This is the usual, this is what we usually do. Yeah? Here's then 2.5% and here's also 2.5%. Yeah? So it depends a little bit on the hypothesis. Uh, what, what are the critical values here? But of course, in your term paper, you can access Google. Not in the RFM exam, though. But in the term paper, it's OK. <laughs> yeah. So you can access Google. And then, of course, you, you, have, you can download all the, you know, there, there are even like uh, programs, online programs, where you can just plug in 
like the probability mass, and then it spits you out the corresponding critical value or so, you know, or it, it gives you actually, um, you can plug in your, your point estimate and then the, the distribution, and then it spits you out how much probability uh, mass is here on the right-hand tail or on the left-hand tail. So you, you get then the p-value autom uh, automatically, you know. So everything is possible nowadays, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's anyways good to know what, what's going on here, you know, in order to be able to interpret something, you have, of course, to know, okay, what's going on here, you know. Yeah, so and just if you just visually now look, I highlighted already for you so that you that is much easier. So <coughs> we have 14 stocks, and we see that three point estimates are significantly different from zero. Uh, if we test this uh, ordinary, if we follow this, this, this simple rule, and we take 1.96 as our critical value, then we, we see that two, sorry, three of our stocks have intercept terms here, have intercept terms that are significant from zero on the 5% level. Yeah, between 2.33 and 2.89 are the corresponding t-statistics. So three out of 14. And now let's assume we have the simple rule that uh, if more than 5% of our stocks and our stock universe have intercept terms that are significant, then we would reject the cap M. We would say, okay, our cap M doesn't work because we have um, a systematic mispricing in our stock universe going on. So four divided by, uh, three divided by 14, is 21 percent. Uh, it's 0.21. Let's take this as a proxy for the p-value, okay? 21 percent is larger than 5 percent. We uh, and, and we say if the mispricing is larger than 5 percent, then we reject the null hypothesis and we say, okay, there's systematic mispricing going on for too many stocks, so the cap M doesn't, doesn't work out. Yeah? So in this case, we, we would conclude, okay, the cap M doesn't, that, um, doesn't work out, there are too many stocks that are mispriced. And now remember, this is now, of course, very simplified and just a rule of thumb. Of course, usually what we actually have to do is we have to use this GRS test, yeah? So we have, actually we have to estimate a multi, multivariate multiple equation model, yeah? And then we have, because we have to take into account the covariances between the alphas. And because the s's are correlated, so are the alphas correlated. So we have to actually to run a multivariate test, yeah? But in this simple framework here, in this very simplified world, we just use this rule of thumb here. Is this clear to everybody? Awesome. I also gave you here the estimates for the gross returns. Of course, what happens if we use the gross returns, you know, the t statistics become larger. Yeah. But of course, we know that the asset pricing models, and in particular the CAPM, are defined for stocks in exact form. And now one more time, can we actually conclude that the cap M is wrong? Now we are back at lecture one, right? Can we actually say that the cap M is wrong? We have this efficient from frontier, yeah. And if the risk-free weight is here, 
then we have the tangential portfolio is here, so the market factor, the theoretic market factor is here, yeah? and here we have all the stocks in our stock universe. So the optimal, so the market portfolio is here. But does our OMX30 actually measure the market portfolio? Is it the actual market portfolio? What is our OMX30 actually is here? If our market index portfolio or if what we use as a proxy for the market portfolio, if it's actually here. So there's a systematic error. It can be also both. It, it can be a systematic error and an unsystematic part in the error. We don't, we don't know that. But what we know is if we have an error in our proxy, this difference here, yeah, this delta, will somehow be passed into the, into the intercept term. It will be somehow moved in our, in, into our, in, in our regression equation. This will be, have an impact on the alphas. So even if, if we have significant alphas going on here, actually we cannot say if the cap M doesn't hold or not. Because it could be that the proxy is simply wrong. So we have to assume that, that, that our market factor, that our proxy, actually really measures what it should measure in, in, order, to make a, in order to make a conclusion here. Yeah. So actually, we cannot uh, tell, tell so much here about the adequacy of the cap capital asset pricing model, right? So let's just, who knows, maybe this kind of question pops up in, in the exam. Who knows? Yeah. <coughs> so if there are no questions, we can move on with the, to the fourth lecture. Yeah. And you know what we do here in, in, in this course is it's very, still pretty, pretty simple, you know. And of course, once you have the basic skills, you know, you can elaborate on the skills and you, be, you can become an expert. You know, I, have, I had some students who, who did pretty fancy stuff in their master's thesis, you know, based upon what they learned here in the lecture. So pretty, pretty amazing. And unsurprisingly, all of them have, have pretty good jobs. So, I mean, there's obviously a correlation, okay. So be between the skills that, that some people have and, and what they do later on in their, after they finished here at the university, you know. So all depends on what you do, on, on what you want to do. But I suppose, I suppose, I don't know, but I suppose that most people who study five, six, seven years, they don't want to fry burgers at, at McDonald's, right? So, so what we discuss now is, okay, now we have uh, our basic model, you know, and in the first lecture we were wanted to estimate, we wanted to trade stocks that have a high a beta, yeah? and what we want to do now is we want to trade stocks that have a high alpha, yeah? If our model is correct, and if uh, stable, if the model is stable, we would expect that our point estimates that we have in the, in the one sample also valid in the, in the later sample. Yeah. So if we, have the, if we take now a subsample and we would estimate, okay, these are, we have a couple of stocks that generate high, alpha, high alphas, we would, we would think that these stocks also generate high alphas in the later sample. Yeah? So we, we, we want, to have, want to invest in stocks that, that generate alpha. And we want to sell those stocks that have a low alpha, like a negative alpha, because they generate negative excess returns after controlling for the cap M. So then the exercise is as follows. 
you consider the following linear model for pricing your assets. Yeah, again, we have the CAT M model here. What you see, uh, excess, excess returns. We regress the excess returns on the market factor and a constant term here. So this is nothing new. Then implement a trading strategy based on the estimated abnormal returns. So the beta zeros, respectively the alphas here. Thereby, you are short in a portfolio that contains 30% of the stocks exhibiting the lowest abnormal returns and long in a portfolio containing 30% of the stocks exhibiting the highest abnormal returns. Use the first 48 months of the sample to estimate the 24 months ahead average return of the long short portfolio and the Sharpe ratio. Is the outer sample mean of the long short portfolio statistically significant? That's now a more like realistic example what you would do if you work in the finance industry, for instance. Yeah. Of course, uh, in real life, these things become more complicated, but that's basically the logic behind it. We were talking yesterday already a little bit about it. Yeah. So what we do is, okay, we pretend here is T is zero, yeah? and here is T is capital T. So we pretend as if you would just know what's happening here. Yeah? This is our data matrix. Yeah? We say, okay, we use from T, T zero until, until capital T is one, we use the information of the data that we have here in this period as our in sample. And then we, we estimate, yeah, we estimate our model, we get our alphas, our alpha i and our beta hat i for i is one to k. Yeah. We implement our trading strategy and, and then we have a look on, okay, how does the strategy perform actually in this forecast period? Yeah. Which is, this is 48 months, so we use, we use a rolling or we use a in sample time window of 48 months, it's four years of data, and we keep our parameters constant, yeah? we determine the portfolios that we invest in, yeah, this is also what you do in the mutual fund industry. Yeah? You have to decide in which assets you want to invest in. So you use some data, you come up with estimates, and then you keep it constant. And we keep it constant for 25 months. <coughs> well, 24 months, sorry. So we estimate, we use data four years to estimate our portfolios two years ahead. And it's the same logic, you know, be, uh, behind all of our anomalies or of our long short trading strategies. But, but they are usually rebalanced every month. For instance, if you take the momentum portfolio, yeah, you take, what you, what you do is, you have a timeline, this is, this is T, zero, this is today, this is t minus one, here we have t minus two, so we, we, we accumulate the returns over this period here, from the past, so we determine our stocks at time zero and keep it one month ahead until t is one. Then we do it all over again, it's an iterative process. Yeah. So we update it every single month. But now we just do it once and we keep it 24 months ahead. But in lecture number six, I think, we will do it iter iteratively as well. Yeah. We, we trade on abnormal returns 
like every single month. But this is what we do now. So again, we start like in every lecture here. Yeah. We upload our data matrix. It is always the same thing. Summer you do as we Finns say. Yeah. So we upload our data matrix. The, the, the data matrix is the same, you know, in all of our exercises. So we, we operate all, always with the same data. We define our x, our gross returns of the index, our y are the gross returns of the of the stocks, our risk free rate is RF. Then we define the length of our data sample. I think either we write 215 or we just write length of Y or if you want height, yeah, as, as I have learned a couple of days ago as well. Yeah, who knows? So then our capital K is 14. That's the number of stocks that we have. Then again, we construct the excess return matrix because we operate with excess returns yeah, same, in the same manner as we did the last lectures all the time we define the excess returns of our index, yeah, the omic 30 again, same thing like, like we did. So what happens then is, okay, we define our out of sample observations. So we want to have 24 observations out of sample, right? So we define capital T2 is 24. Yeah, and how, how you denote it doesn't matter. You, you can choose how you want to denote it, but you have to remember that you defined 24 with a certain, uh, in, a, in a certain manner here, yeah? Capital T1 is 48. This is, in my case, the in-sample window, yeah, containing 48 months or four years of data. And this is actually, I don't know what I have written here, but I have already defined K earlier. So this is actually, you, you, as you see there, so this, you don't need that, that line here. You can neglect it. So then again, I define constants. I define the vector of, of constants because we have an inter intercept term here going on in our asset pricing model. Constant is once T1 and 1. Yeah? So what's going on here? Same thing, actually, that we did yesterday. Yeah? I, I need uh, a vector of once for our regressor matrix. So I define now a vector of ones that has a length of, of T1 and 1. Yeah? This command here, ones and parentheses capital T1, comma 1, means, okay, give me a vector that has ones, that has one column and capital T1 rows. So it's a column vector. Yeah? This guy here. This is our constants. So now we have stored it in our workspace. Yeah? So, and what happens here now, now you learn a new way how to access the corresponding elements in our access return matrix. Yeah? There are, I told you there are, always, there are different ways how to do the same thing. So you can, write the, you can come up with the same conclusion here, writing a different code. Yeah? But this is now another way how to deal with this kind of uh, research question. Yeah? So you can, of course, choose, and in your term paper, you can choose how you want to code all this stuff. Yeah? So you can be more creative. Yeah? And moreover, in your age, yeah, you have uh, probably reached the peak of creativity. Yeah? So the creativity distribution looks something like this. Yeah. We have the age here. Yeah. And uh, let's say 26. Yeah. Let's say 26 is the peak of creativity. And then it goes down again. Yeah. So if you're 26, you are most, most creative, according to research. Yeah. Use it or lose it. Yeah? Of, and of course, that's a point estimate, 26. Uh, obviously, so it's, uh, it's plus minus, I don't know, let's, let's say two years. 
so it was, or three years, maybe 29 and then 20, 23 or something. So some, some people reach their peak when they are 23. And if you're lucky, you're then you're like 29. But on average, it's like 26. Yeah? But this is the range basically where you are mostly creative, where you can come up with great ideas. And you know, all the mathematicians, they, they wear something like that when they had great ideas and all this stuff. Yeah. But if you have read the li literature, actually, I mean, IQ is decreasing here somewhere. Okay, IQ is decreasing. So that's that's a problem. You know, it's it's a problem of, of aging. You know, it, the, the older you get, the less. Uh, or yeah, the I mean, the, the brain is just an organ. You know, and, and obviously deteriorating as age increases. But of course, there's uh, you can somehow. Um, how to say, it diminish the effect of uh, brain aging by, by doing a lot of sports. So if you do a lot of different kinds of sports, like where you activate the central nervous system, then of course your, your creativity remains, or it doesn't decrease in the same pace as for people who do not do any sports. So that's the only way how you can basically um, counter-attack counter this uh, aging process, like doing a lot of sports with high intensity, yeah. just that you know what to do. So, yeah. What's going on here again? What we want to do is now for our in-sample time window of 48 months, yeah, so we want to store again the, the, the betas now we are only interested in the betas. Yeah? We are not much interested in the t-statistics, okay? We are just interested in the, in the magnitude of our mispricing of these abnormal returns. Yeah? And we want to buy those stocks that have a high positive mispricing, you know, because we expect, okay, these stocks are most likely all, are also likely to, ha to generate abnormal returns, positive abnormal returns in the outer sample period. Yeah? So again, we create a, a zero matrix where we want to store our abnormal returns and we store also the market sensitivities here so it's again a 14 by 2 matrix yeah beta zeros 14 by 2 yeah? and again we estimate a for loop here for our k is 14 stocks so we do 14 estimates and what we want to do is Again, what we did in the earlier exercise, we estimate the parameter vector, which is a two by one vector in, in our case, because we have the intercept term and the, and the excess returns. So we have two parameter estimates, so we, so we store them. Yeah. We have the alpha i, the beta i. This, this is what we get out of our estimation. So we transpose this guy, then it becomes a row vector and we store it here. It's one by two. Yeah? We transpose this guy and store it here in our beta in our beta matrix that's that we constructed where we want to store our results in. So what's going on here? That's now a little bit different from last time. I have to take this away here. So again, we want to have, you know, we remember again, it's, we do always the same thing. It's maybe a little boring for some of you. I understand that. So again, we have our OLS formula here, x transpose x inverted, x transpose y. And what is our x here? Okay, our x is now constant. And remember now, this is a 41, for, a 48 by 1 vector. Yeah. So, and our x1, where well, we have the excess returns of the market factor looks like that one double point forty eight parenthesis closed outer parenthesis closed so what does that mean this means okay give me from this x the x one vector has the excess returns of the 
it's actually a column vector. It has the exact returns of the omics 30, right? It says, okay, give me observations 1 to 48. Yeah, 1 is here, 48 is here. Give me this part here and put it in here. Uh, so now we have uh, 48, by one uh, 48 by 1 vector of uh, ones. And we have this 48 by 1 vector that we grabbed out of the excess returns from the OMX30. So, and this, when we put it in this brackets here, in this outer brackets, in this outer brackets here, mean that this should be a matrix. Yeah? This, this defines matrices. So what, whatever you write in here, any kind of vector, defines a new matrix. So this matrix here has a vector of ones in the first column and the vector of excess return in the second column both have the same dimension, 48 by 1. And that's our x, basically our regressor, in our OLS formula here. So it takes the transpose from it times itself inverted times the transpose from it. This is exactly what we have here in the code. Yeah. As you see here. This guy here trans transpose times itself, then to the power of minus one, which means take the inverse, times, and then I have again these three points because there was not, not enough space. So these three points mean, okay, continue the command in the next row. So then the, then the same matrix, it's multiplied with the same matrix transposed times y1 now it says times y1 and it's 1 to 48 1 to 48 double point, comma for first column yeah because i is 1 here's the i index yeah. And in the first iteration, this guy here is 1. All the other stuff remains the same in every iteration. Yeah. So, so what, what, uh, what, does it, what does it mean? It means take from this y1 matrix, yeah, and when we remember we have all of our 14 stocks. This is a 215 by 14 matrix, and it says, okay, in the first iteration, if i is 1, take element 1 until 48 here and multiply it with this matrix product here, what we have defined earlier here. So that's our y in this formula here. We, we take the first 48 observations from our y1 matrix only. And of course, it must be it must have the same dimension, it must have the same length as our x matrix here. Otherwise, we could not operate with this formula here. Yeah? It, it, must, it must be time congruent, of course. Yeah? So that's what we do. After, then we get the beta vector, which is 2 by 1, for the first stock based upon the sample. We transpose it and put it here into our beta matrix where we want to store in our results, yeah, which has zeros, but after the first iteration, yeah, after we have numbers here. Yeah? It's then something like, I don't know, 1.1, 1 .1, 0 0.9. After the first iteration is completed, and i is 2, now we grab the second stock, so everything here remains the same. Our x1 remains the same. Yeah? There's no i, index here obviously. So the only i index here is in the end y1 in parentheses 1 to 48 comma i then i is 2. This is the only thing that changes. So in our OLS formula uh, we want to have now here the corresponding time congruent excess returns of stock number 2. i is then 2. It says okay give me observation 1 to 48 for i is 2 and, then, and when i is 2, we access the exact returns of the second stock in our y1 matrix. Yeah. Again, what we, what we get is a new point estimate for the second stock, 
two by one vector, we transpose that guy, it becomes one by two, and we plug it into our beta matrix here where we want to store in our result. And then we have numbers here. We have maybe 0 0.7 and 0 0.6. Yeah. So if everything is completed here, we, we do this until we have reached the 14 stocks in our Y1 matrix. After everything is completed, and we have here stored our corresponding point estimates, given the first 48 observations of our sample, what we can do then is we plug in beta into the command window and push just the enter button, and what we get then are the corresponding point estimates. Yeah? So what we see is the first stock, for instance, has an alpha of 4.6% per month, which is a huge abnormal return. Yeah? Think, think about it. Yeah? The corresponding sensitivity against the market factor is 0.47. So we have also the highest negative alpha is here stock number, what, what is it, 12? It has minus 2.19% per month. So negative returns, and the market beta close to one. It's one. It's one point oh three. Yeah. So the next step is then. We want to sort this matrix, but with respect to the first column. Yeah. And the, you remember, in the first lecture, we had we had only a vector here. Yeah. We had only a vector of uh, market sensitivities and we could easily sort it. Yeah? There was no problem because it was just a vector. But now we have a matrix. We want to sort a whole matrix <coughs> with respect to the first column. Yeah? Think about we, have, we would use the Farman French five-factor model and adding an intercept term, we would have a 14 by 6 matrix here and you would like to sort it with respect to any of the, market exp to any of the exposures here. Yeah? This is something that you cannot do in EGUS, obviously. Yeah? So you have to use a matrix program in order to solve this problem. Yeah? But we can, once we know the corresponding command, we can basically um, sort our stocks with respect to any sensitivity or, or any point estimates here in our beta matrix. But how we do that? We will discuss next time, which is, I don't know, next week, I guess. On Monday is no lecture because I'm busy. And then we will, but we have then one more lecture in December, I think. I think you have seen it obviously in this MATLAB uh, Moodle, Moodle page, right? <coughs> so then have a good time and see you next week.